International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and we're very proud to have you with us today for the latest in our series of Rebuilding the Global Economy events. This, the first of two sessions directed at the key European institutions, in this case, the European Central Bank and the European Commission, the commissioner on the macro side. We are very pleased to have with us today as speakers, our colleagues, Olivier Blanchard, writing a memo to the president of the ECB, Jean Pisani Ferry, writing a memo to the president of the European Commission, and Angel Ubide, writing a memo to the commissioner for macroeconomics or overseeing DG ECFIN. We're also very privileged to have with us Professor Lucretia Reichlin as a commentator and discussant. I will give all of our members, all of our speakers, a more proper, although insufficient, introduction momentarily. But first, just a word about the Rebuilding the Global Economy project. We believe that the world benefited from a coincident and partially causal simultaneous rise in living standards and economic integration across most of the decades from the 1940s through the 1990s. At some point in the early 2000s, these, both of these processes went into reverse. In the rich world, we had a slowdown in productivity growth and a increase in volatility and the proclivity to crisis. And globalization on various measures went into retreat or stopped, or most of all, became a more uneven, less equal, less inclusive way of doing international integration. We believe that it is necessary to assess what has gone wrong in the global economic system and we take the word rebuilding seriously. This is about building a place fit for all the people of the world to make their living, to prosper. It needs to be large enough to accommodate the growing size of the important other countries that are not currently fully empowered in the system. It needs to be compliant and able to withstand the storms we face, but it also needs to be functional. So it is not some architectural fantasy. This is renovating while people are still living in it. And we do this because there are existential threats that are either directly economic or cannot be addressed without international economic cooperation, including most obviously public health aspects of pandemics, climate change, the productivity slowdown, mass unemployment, and the economic aspects of international conflict. These are all the big picture issues that motivate us, but in the end, we want to be practical and come up with solutions and policy proposals that the key policymakers can act on in the coming months. We started with a bunch of advice to the US incoming administration, the new administration of President-elect Biden, we have interspersed that with, in, with advice to some of the international organizations, including the WTO and the IMF. And today we do the first of two directed to the European Commission. Jean Pisani Ferry is writing as advisor to the president of the European Commission, will be a key member of both this panel and the panel a week from Monday when we address trade, innovation, market, and finance at the European Commission. Let me now turn to my colleagues and in the order in which they will speak. We will have Olivier Blanchard speaking first. Olivier Blanchard joined the Peterson Institute now five years ago, it's hard to believe, as the first C. Fred Bergson Senior Fellow. Olivier, of course, spent most of his career in distinction in academia at MIT, including as chairman of the economics department, and he remains the Robert M. Solo Professor of Economics Emeritus at MIT. Critically, he was the economic counselor and director of the research department at the International Monetary Fund from 2008 until he joined the Institute in 2015. And Olivier, of course, has also recently been president of the American Economic Association and has been a leader in the changing thinking on both monetary and fiscal policy, rethinking macroeconomic policy in recent years. He will be followed by Jean Pisani Ferry, who is thankfully recently a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute, but has long been our partner as the founding director of Bruegel, the leading European economic think tank, and is a major figure in European public life. 
He is, of course, was Director of Program and Ideas in Emmanuel Macron's presidential bid in France and Chief Designer of the French Government's Investment Plan a couple of years ago. He also served as Commissioner General of France Strategy from 2013 to 2016. Critically, in his leadership role at Bruegel and his collaborations with people at the Peterson Institute, he played a key role in the creation of the Franco-German consensus that moved economic policy and laid the groundwork for the leap forward in economic integration in response to the pandemic we've seen this year. Third, I'm delighted to welcome my friend and colleague, Angel Ubide. Angel is the head of economic research for global fixed income at Citadel, and he was a PIE senior fellow from January 2009 to February 2016. He remains an active part of our community, subject to being private sector and having a different life, but his value as intellectually remains widely recognized. He is, of course, a key advisor to the Spanish finance minister and on the steering committee of the Euro 50 group and writes a well-regarded column in Spain, as well as being a frequent commentator in the global financial markets. He previously worked at the Isha group and Goldman Sachs after joining Tudor Investment Company, and but prior to that had been an economist of the International Monetary Fund. Most relevantly today for his discussion of what DG ECFIN and coordination of macro policy in the Euro area could be. He has published a book with the Institute, The Paradox of Risk in 2017. Finally, with the burden and the pleasure of uh, commenting on all of this and more importantly, giving her own views, I'm proud to welcome Lubrahisha Reichlin, who is Professor of Economics at the London Business School and is chair of the European Corporate Governance Institute. She is an uh, honorary fellow of the CEPR, the leading European economic, academic economist network. And she writes regularly for Project Syndicate and the Italian national deity, forgive my pronunciation, Il Correre della Sera, which I know is the leading paper. Um, in addition to her distinguished academic record, from 2005 to 2008, she was Director General of Research at the European Central Bank and continues to be widely cited both in policy debates and in research on applied econometrics, monetary policy, and the business cycle. So we could not have a better time uh, having just followed on the European Central Bank's press conference and decisions, I guess, yesterday, a better time and group. And I now turn it over to my colleague, Olivier Blanchard. Olivier, please. Thank you. I have a few slides which are going to show up, I hope, very soon. Thank you. Good. Um, thank you very much. I, I, I really enjoyed thinking about this. I think there are extremely interesting issues uh, to, to think about. I, I think the starting point of, of any memo like this is, uh, is congratulations uh, to the ECB. I mean, I think I will congratulate most central banks, but uh, ECB in particular. It's interesting because they have missed their, their main mandate, which was to achieve uh, something close to 2%. They haven't, but they have done much more important things. Namely, they have, uh, when markets were disrupted, uh, they came in aggressively and quieted them. And then they have done everything they could to uh, sustain uh, demand uh, activity. They did more than uh, one could uh, hope for. The question is, where do they go from here? And here I found it useful to think about three environments in which you do monetary policy. The first one typically doesn't last very long, but it's very intense. It's uh, when markets are dislocated as a result of, uh, of a shock. And we saw this twice during the financial crisis. Uh, well, three times, financial crisis, your crisis, and then COVID. Uh, you have uh, big inflows, outflows for various reasons. You have uh, self-fulfilling uh, runs. And then the monetary policy can really make an enormous difference. Uh, but these are very special times. The second is uh, the environment of secular stagnation, uh, plus the uh, what used to be called the ZLB, zero lower bound, which is now called the effective level bound, because we can go a bit below zero. And I think that's the environment in which we are in and we're likely to be in for some time. And then there's a third environment, uh, which I think until recently we might have called as normal, although it's not clear it will ever come back. And so I call it olden times, maybe, in which uh, the policy rate is really not constrained. Uh, the normal policy rate is high enough that you can decrease it and use it as a main instrument. 
And that's, again, I think, a very different environment. Now, with respect to this free environment, I think on the first, the ECB has done extremely well. Uh, they basically decided that they had to provide liquidity to whoever needed it, uh, trying to fill all the holes, and they did very well, is my impression. They quieted markets fairly quickly. On the third, uh, you know, this used to be a discussion, what do we do when we go back to normal? And I think the reality is, well, we'll see, because it's not going to be anytime soon. So I'm going to leave the first and the third out, and I'm going to focus on the second, uh, which is uh, secular stagnation plus the uh, effective lower bound. And I'm going to focus mainly on one issue because I think that's the most interesting one, is a combination of fiscal and monetary policy. Next slide, please. Thank you. So uh, the basic point is that in that environment, uh, you need both fiscal and monetary policy uh, to meet the inflation target if you, this is what you have, or the output target if you have both. Uh, just one will not do. And if you look, fiscal uh, policy has been off and on. And there was a period of austerity after the uh, financial crisis where well, that was not enough. Uh, since COVID, they have uh, gone out and spent a whole lot. The worries, I think, is more about what happens next, uh, sometime next year, and the year after. Uh, do they return to rules? And when it has not been enough, this has forced the ECB Olivier, your video is frozen. Please restart or repeat what you just said. If necessary, turn off your video to continue the, the, the speech. It would appear the Northern European Austerians are interfering with Olivier's presentation. Um, this is why we need global broadband. Uh, we're going to have to, Olivier has gone off and we give him a moment to come back. If not, we will move on to John, knowing our audience has limited. I'm, I'm back, I'm You're sorry. Back. Uh, uh, you, can, you can blame the French, uh, the French uh, whatever. The, um, so this has forced, basically, the, I think the fundamental change in that regime is that instead of using the policy rate, you basically reduce spreads on, on various assets, various, uh, various instruments. And during COVID, if we just look at what they have done this year, I think they have done fairly well. The combination of fiscal and monetary has been quite good. The question is what happens next. And the important slide is the next one. And there are three issues where I want to take. Uh, the division of labor between fiscal and monetary policy uh, the second one I've forgotten because it's on the previous slide, but I can just do it here. Coordination, uh, the relation between QE and debt management, and then the fiscal stance. So on, on the division of labor, uh, basically, I think we know uh, that what the ECB is doing is reducing spreads. Uh, there's a bit of an issue about labeling. They still basically use market stabilization or improving the transmission mechanism for what they are doing. I think given the size of a balance sheet, they are doing much more than that. Um, so there's an issue of whether this is counterproductive or not, but that's a semantic issue, not the trivial one, but, a, uh, but, but it, not a major one, but not a trivial one either. The um, fact is that uh, when you reduce spread, uh, you are taking risk. Now, the way it has been done, it has been shared by the ECB and the national banks, it's not catastrophic because I don't think much risk has been taken. But the question, the fundamental question or conceptual question is who should take it? And it's not clear that it should be the monetary authority uh, which takes that type of risk. Uh, at the minimum, there should be a fiscal backstop, I think, and, and, if, and they don't have that at this point. Or it may even be that some of it should be done entirely for fiscal policy. Uh, if you want to help a sector, you do direct subsidies. If you want to help a country, you lend to the country under some conditions. And it seems to me here that at this stage, we probably don't have the right mix. It's okay now, but looking forward, it may not. What might be an optimal arrangement, uh, I have suggested using the uh, ESM and the OMT, a light version of it with very little conditionality, but being there if things uh, go wrong, uh, that could be done this way. I think the ECB still has to be in the markets at high frequency. 
but we have to think about the, the allocation of tasks. On coordination, uh, I'm just going to take an example, which is uh, the evaluation of QE and debt management. And QE is you buy the central bank, the ECB, by its long maturity uh, bond and issues uh, short uh, instantaneous maturity uh, floating rate reserves. Uh, now, this has the effect of decreasing the spreads on the long bonds, but it increases the interest rate risk on the balance sheet of the ECB or the national central banks. Now, at the same time, you have the treasuries doing exactly the opposite. They are issuing long maturity bonds, they are increasing their maturity because it's very attractive. So in the process, they presumably are putting some pressure on spreads up and they are decreasing from their point of view. What's very good about it is that they decrease the interest rate risk on the, on the debt that they have. Now, if you think about the consolidated balance sheet, putting all the governments and the ECB together, uh, then the two operations largely offset each other. And as a first approximation, they can more or less cancel. They don't quite for various reasons, which we could discuss, but it's very close. There has zero coordination as far as I can tell uh, between the fiscal authorities and the uh, central bank. The last uh, issue I would, I would raise is, st still on that slide, thank you, uh, is fiscal stance. And that's probably more of an advice to the, EC, uh, to, uh, to the treasuries rather than the ECB. Sorry, it's, uh, it's, uh, there's a typo here, a mistake. Uh, but I think the ECB is right in pushing the fiscal authorities to rethink, uh, to think about it. It really needs one fiscal partner, not 19, which makes it nearly impossible. It has to be very clear about the fact that uh, if we return to anything like the EU fiscal rules, which were suspended, a while back, but should be put back uh, into play at the end of 2021, uh, that's going to be a big issue. And the way to say it is, if the fiscal authorities don't do enough, then the ECB has to do more. And doing more at some stage uh, will raise credibility risks. It will be forced to do things which are probably not in the interest of the ECB or the interest of the fiscal authorities. Thank you. Next slide. Okay, so okay, the the uh, French infrastructure is back. Um, one more moment. We'll hope Olivier will return as successfully as he did last time. Thank you all for bearing with us. Sorry about this, second time. I'm back, I assume, right? I'm okay? You're okay. okay. Keep going okay. fast. <laughs> I'll go fast. Okay, the, so it's not the time. Uh, on, on expectations, the whole set of measures uh, from average inflation targeting to uh, yield curve control, I'm a bit skeptical. Given time, I'm not going to go into it, but we can come back to it if there's a discussion. The last slide, I think, is a summary of what I think. Uh, I was supposed to have many key priorities. I tend to have only one in general. And this one is just clarify the rules of monetary and fiscal policy. And I've listed what has to be thought about. I shall stop here. Apologies for being shut out twice. Thank you, Olivier. Um, Jean, let's see if the rural urban divide extends to broadband and uh, your perspective as an advisor to the president of the European Commission, how should they think about fiscal and monetary issues going forward? <clears throat> Thank you, Adam. Yes, um, as a writer of a memo to the president of the European Commission, obviously I have to address many more issues, but let me focus on what's relevant for this discussion. And I'll, I'll start from where, where Olivier ended. Uh, he said, clarify the role of fiscal and monetary policy. I would perhaps say redefine the role of, of fiscal and monetary policy, because it's hard to overemphasize the degree to which the EU system 
is based on a definition of the roles of fiscal and monetary policy that dates back to the 1980s. And that was written uh, down in, in treaty uh, and in many legal texts, and which is um, in need for a redefinition. Uh, we spoke of a world in which, um, you know, they were, um, there was a very clear assignment of uh, the role of monetary and fiscal policy. And in fact, fiscal policy didn't have much of a stabilization role. It was uh, uh, essentially the role of, of monetary policy. Um, there was a, the idea that there needed to be a Chinese wall between fiscal and monetary policy, that the great danger was a sort of a contagion between the two um, um, pillars of macro policy. We speaking nowadays much more of a complementarity between uh, fiscal and monetary policy. Um, and, uh, and obviously uh, all that was written at a time when the, uh, the debt was, was low and interest rate were, were high and now we're in the opposite uh, type of situation. So um, this calls for um, exactly what Olivier said and I think well, well, what Angel will, will follow up with, uh, a redefinition um, and acceptance uh, that there are changes in the type of environment we're in that call for a redefinition of a, of a framework that again was predicated on a particular context, which is no more the context we're in. Now I can uh, also emphasize a number of other dimensions in which the context has changed. Um, uh, the uh, EU um, <clears throat> tended to be very much inward looking, inward focused, and for good reasons. I mean, if you look back at what has been done over the last uh, 25, 30 years, the single market, the euro, the enlargement, now we're dealing with Brexit, you know, domestic problems were at the core of the attention of, of policymakers. The uh, change in the external environment called for a much more outward oriented uh, view um, uh, and, and stance for, for the policy of the EU. But we, we should never forget that the median member state is a 10 million um, inhabitant uh, country uh, that does not tend to behave as a, as a rule maker globally, uh, nor um, as a power, but much more as a, as a rule taker. So the change in this uh, global environment uh, and the, uh, the, the attitude towards the global environment is a significant change for the EU. And on top of that, the, the change in geopolitical context, the, the sort of end of the big clear cut separation uh, between the, the, the economic sphere and the geopolitical sphere is disturbing for the EU. So what does it mean concretely? I have a long list of uh, seven items. Um, I think the, what we want to discuss here, uh, what we just uh, discussed on the redefinition of the macroeconomic policy system. At present, we're in a situation where rules have been suspended. So the ECB is exercising discretion and on the fiscal side, the, um, we, uh, the, the general exemption clause of the stability and growth pact has been activated. But uh, the question of the normal regime going forward will arise very soon. Um, um, the suspension of the stability pact will not last forever. And the question very soon will be, do we go back to the old rules? Or do we want to draw the lessons from what we've gone through and redefine the rules? I think the temptation will be to go back to the old rules and uh, to use the pretext that, in fact, with, uh, with low interest rate, with low uh, interest burden on public debt, it's relatively easy to meet the criteria. You know, the, the nominal deficit criterion is much easier to meet when uh, obviously your interest burden has uh, gone down and therefore the consequences in terms of primary surplus are not uh, at all the same, are even much, much, much easier to, to meet. But that shouldn't be an excuse for going back to a system whose fundamental philosophy uh, should, be, should be questioned. So I think that's, um, that's going to be a, a hard discussion to have to which we should be adding the question of the fiscal capacity that uh, Olivier alluded to. So again, this has been solved pragmatically with the next generation EU uh, program with this uh, 
one-off initiative, uh, it's probably right to think that uh, before you want to go for a sort of permanent regime, you want to draw the lesson from this one-off initiative, but you shouldn't uh, sort of put it aside and consider that by going back to the old rule, you just, you know, put it aside for, for, for the foreseeable future. Now, my second um, uh, question that's related is the international role of the uh, euro. Uh, for very good reasons, uh, the uh, EU, uh, the ECB, but the EU in general, has had a very neutral stance vis-a-vis -vis the internationalization of the uh, euro for, for many years, since the start. And I'm saying for very good reason, because, you know, instead of pretending that the euro could serve the rest of the world, you first had to make sure that the euro can serve the, um, the countries of the euro area and to solve the, 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 all the, the difficulties having to do with the introduction of a new currency. The question now in the environment we're in is, can we remain indifferent or pretend to remain indifferent the way we are uh, to the international role of the, of the euro? And I think the changes in the environment and also the fact that, you know, the ECB is a much more of a, of a, of a player, uh, of a major player on the international monetary scene, call for uh, exiting this, this neutrality. What does it mean? It means uh, not an aggressive promotion. Uh, it, not mean, it doesn't mean public creation, like, you know, sometimes you, you have the impression that uh, the, the, the answer some of the uh, institutions want to give. It means solving two uh, problems that are the core of the question of uh, using uh, your currency as an international currency. The first one is the question of the safe asset. Uh, so there will be uh, euro, supranational euro asset issued not only by the SM, but as a consequence of the next generation EU by the Commission for the Recovery and Resilience Facility, um, reaching 750 billion. For how long? Is it, uh, is it something that market should be considered as a, you know, uh, an asset that uh, is going to become part of the, of the normal portfolio of asset, or is it a sort of one-off initiative uh, without, without a future? That's, a, that's an important question. There are many ways in which the uh, EU can consider issuing um, this uh, asset. I mean, it's uh, the next generation EU is not the only one. Uh, but I think that the market needs to know better what the future of these supranational assets. The second is the issue of the swap lines. We've learned during the global financial crisis that uh, if banks uh, are using a foreign currency, they need to know under what conditions they would be accessing liquidity in terms of stress. If they don't have the collateral, they need to uh, get access to liquidity in that currency through their own central bank. And this requires swap lines agreement between central banks. But swap line agreement between central banks, the central bank that uh, you know, provides these swap lines has to be given a mandate. And that causes is a fiscal issue. This requires some support from the fiscal authorities. And we don't have that at present. So I think these are issues that need to be solved uh, uh, if you, you want uh, the euro to become really a, a truly international currency. Um, is it feasible, uh, is it imaginable that the EU will be able to respond to these challenges, which are not minor at all? I think what has happened uh, since last spring makes me hopeful, makes me hopeful because uh, the, 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 the response, uh, the magnitude um, and the unconventional character of the response that have been provided both by the ECB and by the fiscal authority uh, to the crisis uh, indicate that there is a capacity to, to, to move, there is a capacity to act. Nobody expected really uh, what has happened to, to, to happen. Taboos have been uh, broken as regards the possibility of issuing common debt, as regards the possibility of engineering uh, transfers, as regards the uh, uh, way the ECB uh, is behaving with, you know, this de facto uh, spread control Olivier mentioned. So that makes me hopeful uh, on, the, uh, on the capacity to move. And the fact that in, in the very recent days, some of the obstacles on the implementation of this facility 
have been overcome. I'm speaking here of the disagreement over the, the rule of law and uh, you know, de facto the, uh, the reluctant member states have accepted uh, the terms that were uh, proposed by the majority of the member states of the EU as regards the, the control of the EU rule of law and, uh, and the use of EU funds. Uh, all that makes me relatively hopeful. So uh, I wouldn't um, underestimate the magnitude of the challenges ahead. I think they, they are very significant, but I think we do have a good basis uh, to uh, consider that the EU can move forward. The next question, and let me end here, will be the implementation of the recovery and resilience uh, facility. Uh, this is a matter of effectiveness, this is a matter of speed, this is a matter of efficiency in the allocation of funds. This is by no means uh, something that can be taken for granted. If we end up uh, with the misallocation of funds with uh, poor parallel politics uh, at EU level, the lesson drawn will be that uh, you know fiscal issues are too serious to be left to the EU. Uh, if on the contrary, uh, something that is of the magnitude of several times the Marshall Plan for some of the beneficiary countries, help these countries recover and help bridge the gap between the uh, well-off and the worse-off parts of the EU, the opposite conclusion will be drawn. So the challenges are extremely high. Thank you. Thank you, Jean, especially for placing it in the broader context of European developments. Let me now turn to Angel, who, of course, is speaking in a personal capacity, uh, like all our fellow speakers are, <laughs> just, just to be clear. Uh, Angel, over to you, please. Thank you, Adam, and uh, <clears throat> thank you for the, for the invitation to participate. Um, my comments are going to be, to some extent, uh, reinforcement of uh, some of the messages that uh, Olivia and Jan sent but I may get maybe into a little bit more of details. So if I had to define the brief of the Commissioner for Economic and Financial Affairs today, I would say there are two main objectives. Uh, the first one is to make sure that uh, the pandemic shock does not have persistent economic consequences and therefore define economic policies for each of the member states in that regard. And the second one, uh, make sure that, uh, that the policies that are adopted don't increase intra-euro area uh, economic divergences. So that would be the sort of the first uh, point of order. The second point of order would be to have the intellectual leadership and the political push to reform the economic policy framework for the European Union and for the euro area, which as uh, both uh, I think Jan and Olivier have made very clear, it no longer fits the current reality. And it doesn't fit the current reality because I think we all need to embrace, and it would be very important if the Commission does, that fiscal policy is, and it's going to be the main macro-cyclical policy tool for the next decade. This is not something for today, this is something for the next 10 years. And therefore the Stability and Growth Pact must be reformed to adapt to this new reality of basically very low interest rates and very low inflation. So there are two concepts <clears throat> that I want to, to advance. The first one is that sound fiscal policy, it's no longer equivalent to reduction of deficits. So debts and deficits are instruments. They are not objectives of policy. And this is fundamental because the way the stability and growth pact was defined was such that debts and deficits were objectives and they cannot be both things at the same time. They're instruments and so the rethinking has to change. Now, in doing so, it will support the efforts of the ECB to meet its mandate. As uh, Olivier suggested, you know, there is uh, still some room to go. And one way in which uh, this could help is if fiscal policy is now the main cyclical tool, it needs to adopt the strategies of monetary policy. And so it needs to have effective state contingent forward guidance. For example, economic agents need to know that fiscal policy is going to be supporting growth until some conditions are met. One condition that I have advanced in the past is that this has to be the case at least until the level of GDP we had in 2019 is met. It can be defined in different ways, but this is important. And this cannot be done with the current framework of the Stability and Growth Pact. So the Stability and Growth Pact cannot be suspended forever. In my view, it should be revised, it should be changed, and this is something that should happen in 2021. 
So what would be the main action? The main action, in my view, would be to abandon the objective of the 60% debt to GDP ratio. It is unrealistic, and the focus on these uh, levels, as I have mentioned, is, is counterproductive. It introduces a tightening bias on policy. So how to do it? In some sense, going to what uh, Olivier has proposed about uh, standards, where I said, you know, focus on sound fiscal policy with two objectives. The first one has to be, what is the right cyclical policy stance? So define the path for deficits and debts that helps the ECB together to meet the inflation and growth objective and focus on the quality of fiscal policy. So not just look at the levels, look at the composition of what is in the budget. And related to that, protect public investment, which in an environment of very low interest rates, one could argue that it has a higher marginal return than private investment via golden rules. And to some extent, the next generation EU project is already a golden rule for European Union fiscal policy, right? Because it's preserving fiscal policy, I'm sorry, it's preserving public investment for our European countries. So related to this, uh, there are a couple of other, a couple of other issues. The first one is, um, <clears throat> As commissioner, it has to ensure that the recovery and resilient facility is deployed successfully. This is very important because it will show that common fiscal efforts to stabilize the European economy work and that sharing fiscal policy increases the stability of the Euro area and of the European Union. Remember the whole discussion we had over the last decade about risk reduction and risk sharing and the worries about moral hazard and all that, I think the lesson from 2020 is that the more resharing, the more stability we achieve if it's done properly. And therefore, an effective deployment of this facility is going to be very important uh, in that regard. The next step is, as uh, I think uh, both Olivia and Jan were suggesting, is take this opportunity to build a Euro area safe asset. And this is critical. This is critical for many reasons. It's critical because it will contribute to having a euro area fiscal policy. It is critical because it will help boost the international role of the euro. And here I'm linking the two objectives. There is also the good uh, positive side effect of contributing to the development of the European Banking Union. So how do we do this? Well, we need the asset and then we need the revenues. The asset we have it, which is the recovery and resilient fund. And so the secret here or the objective that the commission I think should be promoting is to make it permanent. If we make this asset permanent, we are generating a yield curve in a Euro area risk-free asset that is going to be the embryo if we want for the Euro area um, safe asset. And the second point is to generate the revenues that will be used for the debt service. And therefore what we need is the development of the EU own resources for the repayment of this borrowing. This is important not only to make the Euro area um, safe asset permanent, it could also be used as part of a Euro area fiscal tool. So for example, imagine that there was a share of the VAT that was raised at the European level and it could be raised or cut depending on the cyclical situation. It could be a good way of adding to the policy framework in the Euro area, which right now, let's remember, is completely asymmetric. The European Commission has the tools to force a tightening of fiscal policy, but it does not have the tools to force an easing of fiscal policy. My final point is just uh, <clears throat> closing on the international role of the euro mm -hmm. and uh, linking to the, to the geostrategic situation, right? As, as I think very well, as uh, Jan said, we live in a world where I think you cannot take uh, cooperative behaviors for granted. We live in a world where uh, basically every country in the world, every main economy is now thinking about some sort of a strategic competition or a strategic independence where resilience, which essentially means first take care of your domestic economy and then think about international relations is now in the forefront and therefore developing the international role of the Euro, which I will insist, it cannot be done without a safe asset. You cannot have the international role of the euro without an asset that the rest of the world want to buy in that currency cannot happen. And therefore the European Commission in pushing for the development of the safe asset can contribute to this 
just to summarize it, if the euro area wants to be a powerful geopolitical player, it needs to invest in the euro. Otherwise, it's really not going to work. And this is basically the summary of my points. Let me just share what uh, are the key priorities as I listed in the memo. I went through some of them because uh, I didn't want to repeat some of what was said before. But this is the main message that I wanted to convey. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angel. And obviously, even though the thrust is much the same, there are some points of difference between you and Olivier, which are worth considering. But for an independent, fresh view and someone who by no means was captured by, but has been inside the ECB, please let me turn to Lucretia Reichlin. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you for the invitation. So um, I think that all of us have been uh, in a lot of uh, meeting together. So there is a lot of common uh, views expressed, uh, I think, by, by the three speakers. Uh, and I'm afraid that uh, um, I will be in agreement with uh, a lot of the things that have been said. And uh, I agree with the general idea that uh, um, I think that what we really need to think about uh, is the governance, uh, the economic governance of the euro and uh, the rules and the ideas that have been uh, governed the relationship between the fiscal authorities and the monetary authorities. Uh, we know that, um, I mean, I've called that uh, um, in, a, in a speech that I gave, uh, historical determinism. In the 90s, uh, there was a quite a wide uh, agreement around the world that, that the monetary policy, that the central bank had to be narrow, had to have a narrow scope, uh, scope and had, been separate, had to be separated from fiscal policy and the, and the narrow objective uh, that also the agreement was that um, you know, that uh, central banks should not mess around with, uh, with markets and had to, you know, minimalistic approach to financial market intervention. Uh, now, uh, you know, by coincidence, uh, those were also the years in which the euro era was being uh, designed. And, uh, you know, without uh, that minimalistic agreement on uh, what uh, was the best practice for, for the relationship between uh, central, bank, uh, central banking and fiscal policy, maybe the euro would have never been born because uh, you know, the risk of uh, you know, asymmetric federation with a broad central bank uh, and with coordination between monetary and fiscal policy would have been too great, the political risk. And so it served as well that the consensus in America, not just in Europe, uh, was uh, for narrow central banking. Unfortunately, we are not in the 90s anymore. A lot of things have changed in the way we, in which we understand uh, you know, the, these tools and, this, uh, and how these institutions work. And uh, so we are facing the difficult problem of uh, you know, reinventing our governance, uh, still being uh, a, a federation in which uh, political powers is decentralized and the democratic process uh, therefore is, is decentralized. So I would say now that we are now in transition. So we are between A and B, and, uh, and this is why I think there are some risks that uh, although there have been progress and I'm quite optimistic, La Jeanne has been, there are some risks that uh, things could actually turn out not so well. So we have to be very vigilant. Um, why I, I say that we are in, trans in, in transition? Well, I think that this is quite evident in the way this, the pandemic crisis uh, has been uh, um, has been uh, faced uh, quite differently from the, from the debt crisis a few years ago. Oh, we uh, de facto have a you know, quasi-fiscal monetary coordination, although our institutions are not designed for that. De facto, we had sort of a fiscal monetary coordination with the ECB intervening very proactively and um, in the market, and not only as market maker, as Olivier said, but also, you know, by supportive, uh, very easy financial conditions for sovereigns. And um, so with that uh, uh, support of the ECB, then fiscal rules could be relaxed. And uh, basically, you know, we didn't even need a, a federal fiscal tool because a government uh, could do quite fiscal expansionary fiscal policy under the umbrella and the protection of the ECB. 
So uh, then for phase two, there was this new instrument design, the next generation EU, which contains uh, some elements, uh, some very innovative elements, as uh, Jean said, uh, redistribution, uh, and also, in, uh, you know, the possibility of raising common debt. Uh, now, already this kind of linearity, uh, which was embedded in this kind of uh, uh, informal coordination, uh, is being threatened by the second pandemic, uh, the second wave of the pandemic, uh, where, uh, you know, we are still, uh, you know, in need to have a fiscal stabilization tool to support the economy. And, um, you know, the new generation uh, EU money will come, but not immediately. And also they have a quite different uh, objective because they are this been designed to uh, support growth rather than to stabilize the economy in the cyclical way. So, you know, there are risks. Things can go wrong. Um, there could be, uh, you know, low growth, uh, uh, not only cyclical, but also at the structural level, um, you know, affecting potential potential output, uh, or fiscal risk, uh, financial risk, uh, of course, uh, negative inflation risk. And then uh, down the road, there is this big risk of the implementation of the uh, new generation EU, uh, which uh, uh, has a very mm, weak governance or at least an untested governance. Um, so, you know, and if that fails, okay, so that would be, uh, you know, would make us much more fragile. So what is missing? Um, there are basically three th things uh, which are still missing. Uh, the first is uh, a, Euro era or EU level fiscalization um, stabilization tool at the fiscal level. Oh, the second is a Euro era safe asset. And the third is a better framework uh, to, uh, um, for the ECB to operate in, which would clarify uh, the, the target but also the management of risk. No doubt uh, uh, the new role of the ECB has had a, a quasi-fiscal uh, uh, color, uh, which has implied uh, assumptions of risk. Uh, you know, this is, has been true for the ECB, like for other central banks around the world. But this risk uh, also have, uh, in the case of our, uh, in a monetary union, uh, uh, geographical and redistribution implications, which have to be managed. So we need, uh, for the ECB, there is quite a rich agenda, I think, to go forward. I mean, I don't know if I'll have the time to talk about it, uh, but let me just uh, at least say a few words about, uh, you know, these three elements, the stabilization tool, the safe asset, uh, and the ECB. So on the, on the stabilization tool, I think that uh, there are three arguments of why we should have a, a stabilization tool at the federal level. Um, I mean, it is clear that monetary and fiscal policy, um, uh, that monetary policy, uh, I mean, at the zero lower bound is very difficult for monetary policy to deliver on the inflation objective. Um, it is also true that the evidence of uh, the new policies of the ECB is quite mixed on how these policies have been uh, able to influence the inflation level. They have had some effect through the sovereign spreads, so opening fiscal space for some countries, but there is very little evidence that they have actually uh, been able to affect inflation. So we have, uh, you know, to, to have other instruments uh, um, not only for uh, stabilization of output, but also to reach the inflation objective. Uh, there is also some evidence that the monetary policy has some limits uh, when uh, shocks are asymmetric. And this is the case, for example, today with COVID, where we know that uh, uh, there is a large asymmetry for, uh, for sectors and for countries. And the third argument uh, is actually uh, the public debt sustainability. So that uh, everywhere, uh, you know, high, large public debt, uh, so think of Japan has been sustained by, by central bank intervention and accommodate, an accommodative stance by the central bank. Um, but, uh, you know, in the Euro area, this is always threatened by the fact that, uh, um, you know, we don't have actually mutual debt issuance. We don't have a safe asset. Uh, 
So, uh, you know, there are large, uh, um, there, there are, um, uh, so, so there are problems on how actually the ECB can, uh, without, uh, you know, some, uh, without the a safe asset or, or the fiscal uh, monetary policy coordination uh, or guarantee these uh, uh, very supportive uh, financial conditions without creating uh, some tensions in the system. Um, so on the first issue, so on the on the monetary policy at the at the zero lower bound, you know you can argue that uh, you know what we have today, this informal coordination or between the fiscal and the monetary, are going to some extent uh, to help uh, um, to you know, to help. Uh, 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 the effectiveness uh, stabilization policies, but uh, uh, there are also limitations, and the limitation is what I uh, what I uh, what I referred to before. I mean, this uh, this this tool, the new generation EU, is not a stabilization tool, and uh, is a is only a temporary uh, is a, is only a temporary tool. So we need uh, something better, and uh, you know, I think down the road we will have to think of how to design a tool at the federal level, which would allow this coordination between the monetary authority and the fiscal authority with some target uh, in mind, which could be nominal GDP targeting or, or, or a double targeting target in terms of, uh, of price and, uh, and employment stability. Lucretia, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to ask you to wrap up so we can get some questions in from the audience. Yeah, of course. Okay, so I mean, I think this is my uh, main thing is, uh, you know, the, the, the the, the monetary, uh, so the a federal stabilization tool, the possibility to uh, to raise common debt, uh, to avoid the externalities uh, that we have seen in the debt crisis uh, due to you know the um, the, the safe uh, the, the flight to safety towards uh, the northern European countries. Uh, and uh, and then on the ECB, I will. I have a lot of things to say, but I will. Uh, I will uh, respond to questions uh, if there are questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lucretia, and we'd love to hear more from you. And we will invite you back for that. Um, we have, and I meant to mention this: anyone who's a registered participant can post a question on Zoom Q&A function, and I will try to gather questions on similar topics and attribute where I can. Um, let me start with one from Isabel Lara Miranda to Angel. What do you mean by making permanent the Recovery and Resilience Fund? I mean, it, it's obviously for a very specific purpose. And related to that, um, sorry, the, the, why don't we respond to that, Angel? What I mean by that is uh, <clears throat> the, the way it's designed right now, it's a uh, it's a time limited uh, it's a time limited fund, and uh, in principle that implies that the borrowing needs to be repaid at the end of the period. And what I mean is to create the infrastructure, the legal infrastructure, and the political agreement so that this borrowing does not have to be repaid. It is simply service. And therefore, it will be the source of funding for public investment for European countries for the foreseeable future. And this is important because this maintains and sustains a level of public investment that is positive. And then national budgets can modulate around that wherever they need to do for a cyclical standpoint. It's a first step towards having a European golden rule and a European fiscal policy. That's what I mean. Thank you, Angel. A question for Jean um, the, from Filippo Gori. There's a general consensus about the necessity of changing the EU fiscal framework, but what chance is there to change the treaties in the short term? And if we're not going to change the treaties, how do we get around, or this, I don't want to suggest Filippo is saying get around, that's my uh, interpretation. Uh, how, do, how do we adapt so that the current rules are not still binding? The fiscal framework is much more than the treaty. There are very few things in the treaty. The one thing that uh, is uh, clearly at odds with the current situation is a numerical reference to the 60% debt level, uh, which is in a protocol and has a legal value as uh, the same legal value as the rest of the treaty. But you know the provisions of the treaty saying that uh, member states should avoid excessive deficits. I have no problem with it. Uh, the whole question is how do you define excessive deficit in the current context? Uh, 
But I don't think we should be starting from, you know, what's in the treaty and what can be changed and whether the treaty can be amended. We should be starting from what are the problems that uh, are to be solved, what is a sensible fiscal framework, and that's very much, you know, the paper by uh, by Olivier, Jerome Zettelmeyer, and Alvaro Leandro, they're starting from this question. And then we work back and, and, and see uh, what uh, the implementation of a, of a fiscal framework that is sensible on which there needs to be substantive discussion uh, would imply uh, in terms of uh, you know, changing the secondary legislation or, or changing the treaty. We all know that changing the treaty is much more difficult. It's not 100% impossible. I mean, there have been change in the treaty uh, and there will be change in the treaty also for other reasons. So I think they, they you know, don't put the, 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 the horses ahead of the, or the cart ahead of the horses. Start with a discussion on what uh, should be done and then work out what it implies legally. Thank you very much, John. You being, you and Anja were very concise and I'm not as quick in uh, responding to, to get the questions together. Um, Olivier, uh, coming from, it, it was, uh, so what do you think of the idea of an announced forward guidance between the uh, ECB and, and the fiscal authorities on, on keeping rates low? Uh, doesn't have to be formal yield curve control. This is from Francesco Saraceno. Uh, a joint commitment from the ECB and governments to keep spreads in check until full recovery is accomplished. Is it a point in making explicit what seems to already be happening, if I can add that on? You're on mute, Olivia. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm coming. Uh, the first thing, can I add a footnote to a previous answer by, uh, by Jean? if I may, uh, I, I think that indeed any serious reform of the rules might require a treaty change or a, a lot of creativity on the part of the lawyers. But there's something which can be done when they are put back in place, which is you can keep 60%. But at this stage, there's a rule which says you should adjust 20, you know, one twentieth of the difference between where you are and 60%. This would could be completely unmanageable. I think if you get rid of this and you can get rid of this or suspend it, uh, then you know, 60% becomes some number, and then you're not forced to actually adjust at that rate. So you could adjust very slowly. There could be much more flexibility within the treaty uh, uh, on, on going much more slowly about uh, decreasing decreasing that. Uh, and the 120th uh, rule is not in the treaty. Exactly. So that, that could be suspended and it's not an issue. And if you suspend that, then you don't have to reduce the debt very quickly or you don't have to reduce the debt if, uh, if a cyclical situation is bad. Uh, on, on, on the other, uh, yes, I, I think that the right way to think about it is that uh, ECB maintains relatively low spreads and the governments uh, basically use it to have more expansionary fiscal policy, the exact mix, I don't have a, a, a very good sense. I think at this stage, again, everything I've said is more worries about the future. I think at this stage, the amount of risk which has been taken by the ECB is very small, and I think it's fine. And it has given room to both to corporations and to sovereigns uh, to spend more. Uh, the question is in the future, yes, I would like, I mean, conceptually, a, a fiscal rule uh, fiscal principle along the lines of the monetary rules that we have might be a useful way of combining the two. Thank you. Um, we're running out of time, but a question, a pair of questions for Lucretia. Uh, Christiana Bello and Athanasios Archimedes are wondering about your characterization of the effectiveness of QE. One of them seems to think you said it was ineffective, and one of them thinks you have said that it was effective. Um, so what is your take on QE and on the recent measures in terms of their effectiveness on inflation now put in the EU, or excuse me, in the Euro area, my apologies. I think that QE was effective. I mean, I have two characterizations of QE. One is QE uh, in terms of uh, the ECB becoming market maker and intervening uh, to, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in the kind of uh, liquidity measures uh, and in, uh, in becoming the market maker when markets uh, are dysfunctional. And this was especially in the first part of the crisis. 
and but again uh, also for the pandemic. Uh, in that respect, uh, the ECB was uh, extremely successful. That uh, is mostly a financial stability function more than a macro function. Oh, there is more doubt that the ECB was uh, successful uh, in the pure QE, US style QE, where interest rate is at the zero lower bound or the, the fatty lower bound. And, uh, um, and through and buying uh, um, long term or risky assets uh, uh, and uh, therefore flattening the yield curve, you try to, uh, you know, to stimulate risk in the economy. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, you know, inflation via that channel. Uh, on that, uh, the empirical evidence uh, is extremely weak. And uh, there are two uh, possibilities. One is because actually, you know, the empirical evidence uh, on that channel is weak everywhere. But the other one is that uh, uh, actually, um, you know, there is very, um, the QE was only implemented uh, in, uh, in 2015. And then uh, after one year and a half of implementation was already, uh, you know, slowed down. So maybe there was, a, maybe we don't have enough data point uh, to, uh, to actually uh, understand that. One thing that we know is that from 2012 to 2015, when QE was not implemented, the market uh, understood that uh, as a lack of clarity in the framework. Uh, and uh, therefore, the other instruments that the ACB used in that period, like, for example, forward guidance, uh, or negative interest rate uh, were not very effective. Uh, and every the announcement uh, on those measures, which were supposed to be supportive, actually created uh, um, you know, unintended consequences in the volatility in the, uh, which spreads and so on. So I would say that uh, uh, QE is effective uh, if it is also linked to a very clear communication of where you want to go. I mean, the second type of QE. And unfortunately, we don't have that yet in the Euro area. So in that sense, I would disagree with Olivier that I would congratulate for sure the ECB on the financial stability market maker function. But I think that uh, on the macro framework, the ECB has to be clearer to market. We have seen yesterday also that the market was not enthusiastic about uh, the, the last uh, ECB policy decision because I think markets are not clear about where the ECB is going. And so I, yeah, so thank you, Lucretia. So a last question to Olivier, which may allow him to respond on that. Lorenzo Benismaghi poses a question many have asked in the past on the inflation target you, Olivier, suggest going straight to 2%, but what do you answer to those who suggest that continuing to aim at something you cannot reach leads to a loss of credibility? Shouldn't you aim for a range or something you can get? Um, so in terms of market communication, maybe Olivier will let you have the last word. What does raising the inflation target do? What's credible? So my response would be that, I yes, I saw the, the forecast yesterday and they don't get to 2% until uh, very late, if ever. Um, I still think that it should be the target, but it should come with the message that the ECB cannot do it on its own. Uh, without taking much too much risk. And therefore, this is still the right target, but it takes two players to achieve it, not one. That would be my message if I were at the ECB. Thank you. On that note, let me thank our very active uh, participants in the q and I'm sorry that I could only get a few of your questions in. And thanks especially to Lucretia Reitman for coming in and offering perhaps a more differing perspective than she gives herself credit for, which was very useful to have. Uh, thanks, of course, to my colleagues, Olivier Blanchard, Jean Pisani Ferry, and Hans Kelly Vide for their discussion. I look forward to welcoming many of you back for our subsequent uh, events in the Rebuilding the Global Economy series at the Peterson Institute. In particular, I want to flag for you a week from Monday on the 21st of December. We will be having another event with advice to the European Commission with Sean, but also Reinhilde Fuglers, Jacob Kierkegaard, Nicholas Veron, and Robert Lawrence. We also will next week be holding an event in this series on climate change and the FSB and financial regulation with Mark Carney, 
Carolyn Atkinson, Patrick Conahan, and Olivier John, as well as a week from today, an event on advice of the World Bank and the Multilateral Development Banks featuring Penny Goldberg, Simeon Jankov, Adnan Nazarai, and Monica Dabola. 